May 29th, 1998, Priesthood History in 5th through 8th grade. I trust in Heavenly Father that He'll bless us with His Spirit of Peace. Again, I'm anxious that we have no spirit or feeling of criticism, only a desire to want the truth. We're talking about people in relation to our prophet and the prophets before. And we're do talking about the administration of President John Y. Barlow. The greatest challenges to the one man rule have come from those who were under covenant to uphold that one man. The men who were under the most serious covenant were those who were ordained to the apostleship. By oath and covenant, a man receives the Melchizedek priesthood, and those in the holy apostleship are under a special covenant to uphold all the laws of priesthood. They are especial witnesses of our Lord and Savior. But many people don't understand priesthood. Our prophet has a saying that's explaining the whole truth of apostasy or faithfulness. <coughs> Men rise or fall according to their knowledge of the priesthood. They will fall away from this work if they don't understand priesthood. And if a person truly understands and loves priesthood, they will stay faithful. The correct understanding of priesthood is that God and his prophet have the right to rule in all things. And we, the people, have the right, duty, and privilege to love to obey. There is a scripture in section 85. I will read it to you. The prophet Joseph wrote this down by revelation describing how a certain man would fulfill this. While that man who was called of God and appointed, that putteth forth his hand to steady the ark of God, shall fall by the shaft of death, like as a tree that is smitten by the vivid shaft of lightning. So there is a prophecy that a priesthood man, called of God and ordained, ordained to the apostleship, would one day put forth his hand to steady the ark of God. I remind you that that phrase means. In ancient times, the records of the scriptures were kept in a box called the Ark of the Covenant. It was made out of gold and other precious things. The only people allowed to touch it were those priests ordained for that job. One day, they were carrying this Ark of the Covenant, and it started to tip over. A man standing nearby ran over and stopped it from tipping over and touched it, and immediately he was struck dead. He steadied the ark of God when he had no authority to touch it. Showing how serious it is. The ark of God in our day is the prophet and his word as he does the Lord's will. And when a person puts forth his hand to steady the ark of God, that means he tries to set the prophet in order to tell the prophet what to do, or in other words, 
tell the Lord what to do, because the prophet does as God commands. The Lord revealed to our prophet, and Uncle Roy the prophet confirmed it to him. The man that fulfills this prophecy, the man who fulfilled it was Joseph W. Musser. The way he put his hand forth to study the Ark of God was to teach and print and publish the 1880 revelation of Wilford Woodruff, calling it the Word of God when it was not. It was the revelation of Satan to Wilford Woodruff. Joseph Messer sought to set John Y. Barlow in order many times. Yet he was a great help to the prophet. He published the Truth magazine. He was the instrument for much good. He was called of God through Lauren Woolley to the apostleship. But Joseph Musser taught that all the priesthood apostles held keys in common and that the prophet shouldn't do anything unless all the apostles vote and uphold him. But we read in section 132 an eternal truth that cannot be done away. There is only one man on the earth at a time who holds the keys of priesthood. That man is the key holder. He is the mouthpiece of God. And he is the fountainhead of the Holy Ghost to us. But Joseph Messer taught different. In 1948, Joseph Messer assembled a group of men here in Salt Lake and formed a special priesthood meeting of his own called a Priesthood Prayer Circle. President Jeffs was invited to it. And after going a couple of times, President Jeffs asked Joseph Messer, what about John Y. Barlow? Joseph Musser answered, Oh, he is welcome if he wants to come. This was Joseph Musser's prayer circle, in other words. We already told you the story how Joseph Messer in 1936 got after John Y. Barlow for trying to establish the one-man rule calling him a dictator and how he thought the council should rule. And I say again, Joseph Messer was inspired. He did so much good. He was a very dynamic and outward man. But our prophet says he was also a proud man. And his pride was shown in feeling like he could tell the prophet what to do. As time went along by June 1949, the Lord struck Joseph Musser. He was stricken of the Lord and he had a stroke. Blood vessels in his brain broke and made it so his body didn't work right for a while and his mind didn't work right. He, in effect, died six months before John Y. Barlow, losing the ability to function properly and think properly. And now came a test upon the people. Many people had thought that Joseph Messer should be the prophet instead of John Y. Barlow. Because they said John Y. Barlow is such a simple man. And Joseph Messer was an educated, sophisticated 
very well groomed man putting on a show of great righteousness. The reason I'm telling you this story is because of what our prophet has taught us. Every apostasy since the days of John Y. Barlow has resulted because of Joseph Musser. Or groups of people or individuals have left this work. It was because they upheld Joseph Musser and his teachings rather than John Y. Barlow and the one-man rule. Joseph Musser had started his challenge to the one-man rule in 1928 when he printed with Leslie Broadbent a book called Celestial Marriage? Question mark, a question mark at the end. He published the 1880 Revelation at least twice in the Truth magazine. He published it in a book called The New and Everlasting Covenant of Marriage. John Y. Barlow told Uncle Roy that the 1880 revelation was a delusion. But he also told Uncle Roy it was not time yet to make the correction. In effect, the good seed was sown by the prophet and then the tares were sown by the devil through men who were aspiring, who felt like they should have the leadership. The 1880 revelation was the tares and those who believed it. So the day of the fulfilling of this parable, the wheat and the tares, is our time. In the 1930s and 40s, the people were just coming out of the church. The priest that was coming out of hiding, it was young. And just like planting wheat, And then the weeds or tares grow up around it. If you pull up the weeds while the wheat is small and tender, then the good seed and the wheat would die. So the Lord told John Y. Barlow, don't make the correction yet. The wheat and the tares grew up together. People who believed in the one-man rule were in this work as well as those who believe the 1880 revelation from the 1930s up until 1978. That's a long time for the wheat and the tares to grow together. Men who followed the 1880 revelation, believing it was of God, would challenge the prophet in their time. And that's what the stories will be about in our next discussions. Do you see the great work the prophet John Y. Barlow performed? John and Lauren Woolley caused that the true priesthood would come out of the church by ordaining President Barlow and others. For a time the other apostles ordained by Lauren Woolley helped. But President Barlow carried the load and called other apostles by revelation. And it was those men who have carried on, the men ordained by John Y. Barlow. Some of those apostles called through President Barlow turned to Joseph Musser as their leader. Those men were Marion Hammond, Guy Musser, and Alma Timpson. They looked to Joseph Musser and what he did as what they should follow, though they did acknowledge John Y. Barlow as the prophet, being the one who ordained them or called them. 
The story of one of those men, Alma Timpson, is given in this history. John Y. Barlow was praying fervently a few weeks or months, we don't know exactly when, before he died. He was praying that Uncle Roy would come up from Mexico. Uncle Roy received the impression he needed to get up to Short Creek. And he left everything and traveled up. And he met John Y. Barlow. And President Barlow said, I've been praying that you would come. Who should we call into the council of the apostles? And Uncle Roy said, I've had the impression of Alma Timpson. And John Y. Barlow says, you were right. Two days before President Barlow died, President Jeffs and Guy Musser were there with President Barlow. President Barlow said, I have two men in mind, Alma Timpson or Rulin Allred. And President Jeff said, Alma Timpson. And John Y. Barlow said, you are right. Uncle Rich, after President Barlow died, revealed that he had had the impression a long time before that Alma Timpson would be called. And we see the prophet tested those men. And they were one with the prophets. And upheld him in who he should call. John Y. Barlow was too sick to ordain Alma Timpson. So he told Guy Musser, go get your father and tell him to ordain Alma Timpson. They did so. As far as I remember, this was December 27th or 8th, 1949. And I'm quoting from the record of President Jeffs. Joseph Musser, Guy Musser, and Rulin Jeffs laid their hands on the head of Alma Timpson. They were to ordain him to the apostleship. Joseph Musser was to do it and be mouthed, but he was unable to do it. His mind wasn't working right. He couldn't say the words. Guy Musser, seeing this, then found Charles Zitting. And according to the direction of John Y. Barlow, Charles Zitting, Guy Musser, and Roland Jeffs ordained Alma Timpson to the apostleship. Two days later, President Barlow died. Uncle Roy was just coming out of Mexico. Having completed that mission, the great experience of his crops being preserved had taken place just a short time before. Uncle Fred was helping Uncle Roy move out of Mexico. And Uncle Roy had the impression that he must go right to Salt Lake. He stopped in a certain city, called up to Salt Lake, and he found out that President Barlow had died. He arrived in Salt Lake about the next day, and on January 1st, 1950, about two or three days after President Barlow died, Uncle Roy was at the meeting in Salt Lake. He bore testimony of John Y. Barlow. He said he was the sweetest man he had ever met. If people would criticize, John Y. Barlow would just stand up and walk away. He wouldn't listen to criticism. And that is why Uncle Roy, seeing the work of President Barlow, Uncle Roy said, John Y. Barlow was one of the greatest prophets. President Barlow was a man who could walk and talk with God and with the prophets who had gone before.
I now turn to the testimony of Uncle Fred. Uncle Fred was present when there was a certain, on a certain occasion, a few days or weeks after President Barlow died. The brethren down south were continuing the United Order effort with the United Effort Plan. Uncle Roy, Uncle Rich, Uncle Fred were down south with others. They were desired of the Lord to know what to do to continue on the United Order effort. And here was Uncle Roy acting without seeking the direction of the apostles who were ordained before him. And why was that? It was because President Barlow told Uncle Roy that Uncle Roy would need to carry on this work. And on this special occasion, it was a priesthood meeting of just a few men down south. They held a priesthood meeting where they were fasting and praying for four days. It says, Uncle Carl, Uncle Rich, Uncle Roy, and Uncle Fred. I think I have the names right. Fasting and praying for those four days at the end of their fast, they got together and took all the money out of their pockets they had and laid it on the table. At the end of their fast, this is the testimony of Uncle Fred. Uncle Roy stood up and he began to speak. I can't tell you what he said, said Uncle Fred. But it was a very vivid thing in my mind. He sounded like Uncle John. His voice sounded like it. His usage of words was like Uncle John. And as far as I am concerned, the mantle of Uncle John fell on Uncle Roy. And I knew that he was my head. He said, counsel or no counsel. He knew that Uncle Roy was the key holder. And the Lord had placed upon President Johnson the keys of priesthood. I read Uncle Fred's testimony because he was present on this occasion. It is similar to the time after Joseph Smith died, when Brigham Young stood up before the people in Nauvoo, and the mantle of Joseph fell upon Brigham Young, meaning many people saw Joseph Smith as Brigham Young taught. As they looked at Brigham Young, it sounded like Joseph Smith. And that was the witness for many people who the next prophet was. And thus Uncle Roy continued on the work he didn't stand up and claim his position in great announcements. He quietly went about his work. He acknowledged the apostles who were ordained before him. They would take lead of the meetings. Sometimes when they would come down to Short Creek, or he was in Salt Lake, he would acknowledge them as being ordained before him, he didn't step out and make great claims. But gradually, the apostles who were ordained before him fell away, and Uncle Roy continued the work. And by him being in that position and leading this people, you can see who the Lord chose.
But here in Salt Lake, when John Y. Barlow died, many people thought Joseph Messer was the key holder. Yet he was unable to function and work properly. Now we come to the story of another man who aspired to the leadership, a man named Rulin Allred. You'll notice he's one of those in that picture, the 15 who went to jail in 1945. I read the journal of Rulin Allred, and I found something in his character, something that would cause him to have challenges. He recorded while he was in prison that he felt he had the right to question what John Y. Barlow said. That is an aspiring man when he feels like he can question whether or not the prophet is doing right. And I tell you young people, the Lord will lead his prophet right. That's the lesson you're learning in all of this. Rulin Allred was a man who was like a doctor, a naturopath, or he took care of people through natural means, herbs, instead of the drugs that doctors use. And he was the one who took care of Joseph Musser while Joseph Musser was sick. When Uncle Roy was called in 1941, John Y. Barlow received a letter from Rulin Allred and Lyman Jessup. They said in their letter to John Y. Barlow, Why not us? We were promised. So he desired to be ordained to the apostleship and hadn't been called yet. Uncle Roy was the prophet in 1950, but this Rulin Allred went to Joseph Messer, and he claims that Joseph Messer laid his hands upon his head and ordained him to the apostleship. Remember, Joseph Messer wasn't even able to ordain Alma Timpson. Rulin Allred made his claims. He told people that he had been ordained. And word went around that this had happened. There was a council meeting called here in Salt Lake. Joseph Musser came. Rulin Allred came with him. He was asked, what is he doing here? Joseph Messer said he wants to make his claims or speak. So Rulin Allred described how it all happened. Then he left the meeting. Guy Messer asked his father, Did you ordain Rulin Allred to the apostleship? Joseph Messer said, No. What did you give him, he was asked. He said, I don't know. Did you give him a delegated authority? Joseph Messer said, yes. Now, every priesthood bearer has a delegated authority to only do as the prophet directs. This took place at the end of 1950. In February 1951, at those special priesthood meetings, a special prayer circle, several of the brethren were present. And in walks Joseph Musser, Rulin Allred with him and others. During this prayer circle, they were sitting in a circle, Joseph Musser called for a chair to be put in the middle. And then Joseph Musser said, David Jeffs, come sit here. I want to ordain you. 
My grandfather said, no, this is not the right way. Joseph Messer then turned to President Jeffs. You come and help me ordain your father. My father, President Jeff, said, No, this is not right. Joseph Messer turned to his son Guy, who was an apostle. Come help me ordain him. Guy Messer said, No. They knew that Joseph Messer wasn't able to think right and do right. He had a stroke. Sometimes he couldn't even find the words to speak. Rulan Alred jumped up, took hold of the arm of Joseph Messer, and as he left, he said, This is the last time you will see us. And Rulan Alred claimed that because the other apostles rejected him, he was now the keyholder, or he was the only one with Joseph Messer, and all the others lost their apostleship. And through his aspiring, he took over Joseph Messer completely. And President Jeff says, we didn't see Joseph Messer in our meetings anymore. The Alredite people took him over. And there was a division, a separation of people who would challenge the one-man rule. And that is how the Alred group of polygamists started. Do you see the great error in it all? An aspiring man calling everyone else wrong and he was right. And I repeat what the prophet Joseph said. When a man accuses those over him of wrongdoing, when he himself is right, Beware, he is on the high road to apostasy. Rulan Alred then went about and called his own priesthood council. Men like John Butcherite, Lyman Jessup, and others. They claimed to hold the priesthood, and that this priesthood was now fallen and wrong. Rulan Alred taught that marriages should not be done by revelation through the prophet, that the people should go get their own revelation. And thus you see, the Lord used him through Joseph Musser to lead hundreds of people away. Today, those people look like the Gentiles, Yet they believe in plural marriage. They claim Rulan Alred was a great prophet. But I've told you the story as President Jeffs witnessed it. So there are many people today who claim authority. You young people must have a strong testimony of your own. And I've quoted to you the testimony of a man who witnessed these things. John Y. Barlow saw Rulan Alred was aspiring way back in 1941, and he told President Jeffs about it. And he fulfilled his aspiring desires when Joseph Musser was not the keyholder and unable to function properly. We've printed in this history the testimony of Aunt Leona, who was married to Rulan Alred. How he tried to convince her and took her to see Joseph Messer. And her testimony was that Joseph Messer wasn't the same. She could tell his mind was gone. This was such a test on people in Salt Lake that many fell away because they did not understand priesthood. 
And they didn't have the testimony of Uncle Roy. Even some of the apostles taught and thought that Lewis Kelch and Legrand Woolley and Charles Zidding and Joseph Messer should have the rule over Uncle Roy. So that's why Uncle Roy was so careful. In time, the Lord showed who the keyholder was. As Lewis Kelch and Legrand Woolley stopped coming to meetings and didn't help in the work, Charles F. Zitting had challenged the brethren while in prison, and Joseph Musser had put forth his hand to steady the ark of God. Who else would the Lord choose? He would choose a man who was faithful in all things, Uncle Roy, who did what the prophet John Y. Barlow commanded in all things. We leave those men in the hands of God. We don't criticize. I just voice the story as our prophet tells it. The Lord will be their judge, and all of us will be judged according to the light and truth we're given. But I tell you these truths so you will know that the Lord is in charge of this work, and he upholds his prophet. And we need not fear following that one man. All these people who fell away, they fell away because they doubted the one man, criticized him, had feelings against him, some way or another. They felt like they could challenge him. And that was the beginning of their end. So stand by our prophet, young people. No matter what people say, no matter what happens, just know it. The Lord will lead our prophet right. President Jeff also stood faithful and true with Uncle Roy and helped Uncle Roy in his great work. You can read it in our prophet's sermons. Early on, he called John Y. Barlow the one man. And all through the sermons of President Jeffs, he recognized Uncle Roy as the key holder and one man. But this idea that the council held keys in common continued in the minds of many people all, all the way up to 1978 when Uncle Roy made the correction. And it was Joseph Musser who pushed that lie or upheld it. Look what the Lord has done for these 11, 12 years. There is only one man holding the apostleship here in mortality. And the Lord is sealing in our minds once and for all that there is only one man on the earth at a time who holds the keys of priesthood. There are no others holding that order of the apostleship here on the earth in mortality. Can we see this is true now? There are no other apostles who could even claim authority. So young people, the Lord is sealing in your mind how to turn to Him by coming to this one man.